Hello and welcome, folks. My name is Ryan Chapman, and I'm extremely excited to be here to give an overview of the new and upcoming Forensics 528 Ransomware for Incident Responders. So, yeah, here we are. This has been under development for a little over a year and could not be more excited. We, uh, I'm saying we. Uh, I wrote the course myself, but I cannot say that because I had a ton of help. We had a bunch of folks who were 1099 and brought in to ensure that this is the best possible course for anyone who needs to potentially, hopefully you don't have to, but you better be prepared, right? Respond to ransomware. So on the screen right now, let's make sure we got it. Yeah, we have our course agenda. So I, I guess I should pause for a second. By the way, uh, this Ryan guy on your screen. So I have been working as a principal incident response consultant for about ah, three years now, a little over that. And in this line of business, we deal with a lot of ransomware. It's a bit unfortunate, but you know, there's job security, I guess. You got to find the positive. So as a consultant, we pop into different environments all the time. You know, disparate environments, some that are extremely well-tooled and are ready. And others, eh, not so much. And by the way, when I say, I should say that the end of the spectrum are the folks who have a sim with full amazing logs. They have sysmon logging, process auditing, all these great things. They have an expensive EDR. And most organizations they simply don't have that. So whether you do have that or whether you're simply, you know, you can consider yourself a small medium business, a heck a mom and pop shop with a couple folks in IT. And you know, when it hits the proverbial fan, what do you do? How do you act? You know, when do you find it? How do you detect it? How do you hunt for it? Um, one of the things that we're going to be focusing on is dwell time. These ransomware operators, they don't necessarily, well, some of them do, but they don't necessarily just pop in the environment and then immediately start firing off and like, ah, go nuts. Sometimes they do. I'll we'll mention that coming up too. But oftentimes there are a ton, and I mean a ton of just these silly little things that they do constantly in your environment. And the media has portrayed ransomware attacks as these crazy, extremely sophisticated, you know, well thought out attacks. Nuh uh, that it couldn't be further from the truth, to be honest. Many of these things are they're similar to a smash and grab operation, really. They've, um, the I guess the, the threat actor scene as a whole has created an ecosystem where these threat actors thrive by essentially being script kitties or skitties, as we might call them, right? And they just receive these manuals and it's like, hey, step one, do this. Step two, do this. And do step three. And they go, okay. And they just whoop, 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 whoop. And it's really not that complicated when it comes down to it. So the course was written from the perspective of the incident responder. So who is the incident responder? Well, you, that's who it is. So whether you're in, uh, you know, you could be in a business team. We have the incident response team, but then you should also have a business incident response team or the BERT, as that's called, the BERT, 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 BERT. And those folks, you'll have representatives, you should, from HR, from public relations, from legal counsel, like you name the business functioning, you know, management uh, sectors, organizations, I should say, they all should be involved. And in IT, Many people think, oh, the incident responders, like the people, you know, like Ryan, that, that get hired, that we're the ones that do all the hard work. Uh, okay, you know, we're going to be doing the hands-on keyboard analysis, gathering artifacts and parsing them and all this other fun stuff, but everyone needs to be involved. And as we go throughout this little presentation, I'll show you exactly why. So let's get to it. These sections that we have in the course, one, two, three, and four, this is a four-day course. The first section of the first day is ransomware incident response fundamentals. Day two is the modus operandi or the MO of the operators or affiliates or threat actors, as I like to call them. You'll hear me use those interchangeably throughout. I'll show you the roles coming up, but essentially I call them actors, right? The bad people, the hackers. So the MO section on day two really breaks down all the different phases of the attack lifecycle and how they carry them out, what tools they use, why they're so common, how they're easy to detect if you're just looking for them. Like, it's really not hard. And then we get into the advanced ransomware concepts on day three. And the course is wrapped up in a big, pretty little bow. No, a big, pretty little? That doesn't make sense. And a big, beautiful bow. How about that? Like a brand new, expensive car on Christmas Day. 
with a course capstone. And the course capstone challenge is a full day hands-on. You can consider it a capture the flag, a CTF if you'd like. And throughout the course, days one, two, and three, everything is structured to be hands-on and kinesthetic learning, if you will. So we have a major, major, I like that sense, major, a very large data set that we've generated. And uh, I want to talk about that and how the labs interact with that and how that all comes together. Let's get to it. First off, where does this course sit in uh, the pantheon of SANS courses? Well, when it comes down to it, right, if you have a background in Windows forensic analysis, awesome. If you don't, okay, we are going to be going over a lot, a lot of Windows artifacts in this course. So if you're, for example, familiar with shell bags and shim cache and SRUM data, right, system resource, all that fun stuff, if you're already familiar with that, fantastic, you have a leg up. If you're not, that's perfectly fine. What it breaks down to is this. This course is written for the incident responder. So while you may be responding as part of maybe the data center team or maybe just someone who doesn't necessarily do low-level forensics in Windows, you will be introduced to all of that stuff. We have overviews. We have definitions. You will have a leg up if you have that experience. But if not, you're going to be perfectly fine regardless. And looking at pretty much every other course in the, the BFER curriculum, if you have 508 experience, obviously, duh, right? We're going to be doing advanced incident response. Cloud forensics and incident response is also applicable because you'd be surprised what some of these ransomware actors are doing with cloud-based fun stuff. And then really, it breaks down network analysis. You may have PCAPs in your environment. You may not. Cyber threat intelligence. We track these threat actors as much as possible, including the affiliates. 608 enterprise class incident response and threat hunting. I mean, we're going to be using some of the tooling that they use in 608. Shout out to all the, the crews who put these courses together, by the way. I cut my teeth teaching SANS Forensic 610 reverse engineering malware for two years. And we are going to be decoding Cobalt Strike beacon files. So we are doing hands-on malware analysis in this course. And of course, the good old classic 504, you know, um, all the above courses, they all feed really well into this course. Again, if you don't have this experience, as long as you're willing to do a lot of reading, because I wrote so many step-by-step -step instructions, you're going to be just fine. So here's the breakdown. This is day one, right? We have our course intro and overview. We then get into the history of ransomware. Like, what is ransomware? What does that even mean? And then we're going to talk about what does a ransomware attack really look like? And then we get into the tradecraft of analysis. And this is where we start breaking down how do you do your job and what do you do to do it, right? What do you do to do it? That's a fun one. I'm going to quote myself on that later. Ransomware analysis at scale then takes it up a notch because in a ransomware investigation, you have to have a holistic picture of the environment. And we show you some examples on how to do that. Here's an example right away about how much ransomware sucks. That's my favorite tagline. Ransomware sucks. Why does it suck? Well, while I was developing this course, we got hit with a ransomware attack. I kid you not. We have a network range environment that we've built out. I'll show you more on that coming up. And in one instance, I decided purposefully, you know what? Let's leave this a little bit insecure. Let's leave it open. Now, first off, we had to attack it. So I wanted it to be insecure. And I wanted a remote desktop protocol open to the internet with a super stupid password, as I call it. You know, really shouldn't use that password. And I thought to myself, we're going to attack it tomorrow. Like, there's no way. There's no way that a ransomware actor or any other threat actor will come in like overnight, right? Oh, I was wrong. As soon as I logged in the next day, we found this. We were literally ransomed. Our ransomware range was ransomed. Fan freaking task. You can't make this up. <laughs> you can't hope for more than this. The best part about this is that the threat actor didn't realize that this was an extremely well-tooled environment. I had all the bells and whistles enabled. Sysmon was running. We had a hunting elk distribution. All the logs were being offloaded by wind log beat. Everything was configured. Logs weren't rotating as quickly. You know, like, everything was great. So I got to analyze the whole thing. I was like, you silly. You shouldn't have done that. So the focus of the course is applying digital forensics and incident response techniques to ransomware. This is not necessarily a defense preparation course. This isn't like, let's go into Active Directory and configure these things and do that and do this and click here and set these GPOs. That's not the design of this course. But as we go through the various attacks, I definitely do talk about, hey, this succeeded most likely because you, you know, this wasn't enabled. 
So there are a bunch of these preparation steps that people can still learn. It's not a general IT management course in terms of how do you get to get like, how do you get PR and how do you get your legal team to, you know, work with threat actors to potentially pay the ransom? Now, technically, we do discuss that actually for a good half an hour at least. But the whole point is, is that what this really boils down to is the hands on. I always say that that phrase of anyone who knows me right now is like, he's going to say it again all day long. And I will hands on response to ransomware. So if you're familiar with some of these artifacts and you can find a lot of the artifacts that we go through in the Windows Forensic Analysis poster that's heavily associated with Forensics 500. Rob Lee eventually created that back in the day. Tons of SANS instructors have contributed to it. And a bunch of our incident response courses focus on this type of data. If you are familiar with NTFS analysis, like MFT, the USN Journal, why it's important, how you may have around 48 hours to obtain it, things like that. If you're familiar with the regular expressions and base 64 decoding, awesome. If you're not, this would be a good time right now to take a little screenshot of my screen here and just kind of get yourself a little prepared, if you will. We map our tactics. So I use the tactics. I try to avoid mapping too many techniques, but the tactics to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, because it's IR in 2000, what years is 2022? If you don't have it in a course, like, what are you doing? So these are the major phases of an attack, and we map them all to exactly how ransomware actors do their dirty deeds. Our virtual machines we provide, there are two custom virtual machines. Shout out to Mark Hallman. Thank you so much from SANS SROC. That's our development crew who helped put these together. And we have a SIFT workstation, and we have a, well, technically, a Windows SIFT workstation. I'm going to take a moment right now to show you what I'm talking about. You're going to receive two virtual machines, and this is one of them right here. This is our, obviously, the Windows machine. We have a bevy of tools included, all the Zimmerman tools you could possibly want. We have a bunch of the Nearsoft tools, actually, all of them, the Nearsoft launcher, if you're familiar, a bunch of malware analysis tools for fun things. A bunch of posters preloaded. We have our lab data over here. Come here, buddy. There you go. So here's some of our lab files, for example. This machine is perfectly suited to the analysis tasks at hand, including we have collected a bunch of forensic evidence from our network range. More on that very shortly. All of that data has been included. So you have the raw host collections. Let me just double click you. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, what do you collect for this particular incident? This, this is what we collected, right? For scenario one, that is, there are multiple scenarios, more on that also coming up. So we have all this fun stuff. You also have Elasticsearch loaded and rocking in the SIFT installation. So you have both machines have your virtual workbook, which is what we're looking at here. We have time sketch loaded for scenario one data. There's two scenarios, attack scenarios, let me get into that. And then we have a whole bunch of data loaded in Elasticsearch over here. And the SIF VM, I want to go right there. I'm going to set this guy. Let's go full screen on that little bugger. And then set this little fart to 100. There you go. And name. So we have two attack scenarios. All of the machines in the attack scenarios for, well, scenario one, I should say, all of them have been ingested. I'll talk about exactly how and how that pertains to different types of organizations. Hopefully one of them maps to you, and trust me, it will. And then for scenario two, we have much more verbose logging. So the idea was scenario one was is suited more to, we don't necessarily have a sim. We don't have all this crazy, amazing stuff funneling in. But rather, should ransomware hit, like, oh, what do we do? What do we have to collect, and how do we do it? That's mostly after the fact. Right. If you are a what I call a well-tooled environment, you already have a bunch of logs, or you should. I really hope you do. Right. How many logs do you have? Oh, we have six days. That's not enough. Right. We talk about those things too. But if you have a bunch of cool stuff like PowerShell logging already enabled, you have Sysmon with process auditing, you have WMI activity logs, all this great stuff. So our scenarios are not just two separate threat groups, but they are specifically that's a hard word specifically collected such that you can map it exactly to how your organization would react to such an attack. So let's go back over here. We have a focus on tools that are mostly free and open source. I do not use, I don't believe I use, I, don't, I intended not to, 
any commercial tools within this course. So what I mean by that is the real focus here is for you to be able to take the course, go right back to work and get, get to work, if you will. Go back to work and get to work. We go over tools. You should be able to just download, install. You know, I, I, it's cute to say it's all free. You need developers and time and resources and virtual machines. I, I know that. But the idea is that while you may have a tool like Magnet's Axiom, which really does make ransomware, sim well, I shouldn't say simplistic, but much easier analysis, that is, we don't cover those. We cover all the tools you can just go and grab and not worry about, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year, let alone millions of, of uh, licensing fees and, and things of that nature. So we went over the VMs. There's the workbook. Let's take a gander at the workbook before we get going too far here. So let me pop out a full screen and then go to this guy right there. In your workbook, you've got a ton of resources, just like you would expect. Uh, we've got our course share, and I think I have this bad boy loaded right now. In our course share, I have a number of things. Which, by the way, it's a public share. So for any of you right now, you can just go to 4528.com slash share, and it will take you right to our course share. This is all technically publicly available. We have a bunch of screenshots, including screenshots taken from the dark web that show you all kinds of cool background information and research and more specifically threat actors just running their mouth right so i actually 1099 someone to help me out shout out to you you know who you are i won't say your name right now but uh this person she went out and just gathered a ton of awesome screenshots and i'm going to be dumping probably another 100 in here so these are just examples uh, that you'll find screenshots. We also have, as we go throughout the course, we run a bunch of tools. And when running those tools, or talking about them at the very least, I wanted to show examples that you would get from running those tools. So if we're parsing or piecing back together RDP cache bitmap uh, tiles, right? Here's examples of exactly what I obtained via the RDB cache from the ransomware attack that we experienced, right? Not the one we curated, the one that we were like, what is this? So anywho, check out the course share that's located in your workbook. In the workbook, we also have well, troubleshooting, of course. And then we have our information on Samaran Protect or Samaran, if you will. Um, that is, uh, you may notice on my wall, it's right, it's right there at my shoulder. That's uh, Samus Aran from Super Metroid, Nintendo Super Metroid. I would definitely not stomp on or even touch a copyright. So this company is not called Samus. It's called Samaran, <laughs> which is definitely not directly related to that. But Samaran Protect is an external, or excuse me, is an extermination company. Now, many SANS courses use things like, you know, um, like the Stark Research Labs. And I think it's really cool that we use these advanced, like they make, uh, not chemical weapons, hold on, whoa, let's pull it back, uh, nuclear weapons and things of this nature, right? I wanted to show that no matter what your organization is, if you are impacted by ransomware, the impact that is generated can be much larger. That blast radius can really affect people. An extermination company, you're like, ah, they can't go, you know, take care of bugs and stuff, right? Well, hold on. They have service level agreements. They mix chemicals on site. Uh oh, they have forced IT staff members, but none of them are dedicated to security. And I'm sure that some of you right now are going, yeah. Yeah, that's me, right? Or, or you're the one security uh, they, you know, guy or gal uh, who is in charge of everything, right? Including security. And in this network, we've got 16 different hosts, technically 15 usable hosts, with three different VLANs. We have a demilitarized zone, a server VLAN, and we have workstations where our users have access. And of course, they can also log in remotely via the company VPN. So we have this environment that we've created. And the idea it hold on, hold on. The idea is even if an extermination company goes down, what if they have contractual agreements with healthcare? What if it's a, a hospital that all of a sudden has an infestation? And it, because of all these uh, jurisdictions, rules, guidelines, they can't operate if they can't get rid of those, you know? So what happens? What if it's a daycare? What if the daycare gets shut down? All of a sudden, how many parents are at work that now can't be at like they have to go home, right? There's an impact, no matter how large or small you think your organization may be. So I chose something that's kind of like a little, a really small example of this isn't a massive company, but it's very, very common for some of the ransomware we deal with. And of course, it scales out pretty well. We have two different attacks that we've devised. We have created 
two different ransomware groups. They are an amalgamation of the current day and for the most part active right now threat actors that we see. I didn't want to focus solely on group A or group B, for example, uh, going with dark matter or what have you, because they're so ephemeral in nature. And I didn't want to have like, oh, we're learning about this one group. Well, now they're gone, right? So we took all the different methodologies from these various groups and put them together. Shout out to Cody Starks and Chris Brewer, who were extremely helpful, by the way, in the development of this course specific to the attacks. And for that matter, the questions and answers for your CTF, which are based on the attack data. So we have Blue Locker. Blue Locker comes in via RDP and they do stupid stuff. When they come in, the aftermath of that is reviewed after the fact. So scenario one is built more like you don't necessarily have all these tools in place. Ransomware hits, what do you do? Scenario two is Balrog. And if I move my camera, you'd see I actually have Balrog or Boxer from Street Fighter on my wall there. Um, so Balrog is another amalgamation, but they come in via phishing. There's an Excel file. The Excel file, which I built and I was all happy to do because I love malware, has a VBA-based macro downloader, which downloads a stage one. That stage one, by the way, was built with Scythe. So shout out to George Ochias and his crew, great tool. That then basically mimics a, uh, a malware as a service. So Iced ID, for example, Hansen or Emotet, whatever you want to call it. That then downloads a stage two. And then after that, Cobalt Strike comes into the mix. Ah, come on. Why? Because we see it in so many ransomware cases. So this scenario is not just a completely different attack. Not, not just the entry method, right? The infection vector. But rather, everything about the attack is completely different. Okay. However... The data that was collected is in a much more uh, tooled, well-tooled, I keep saying it, I'll just keep saying it, well-tooled fashion. We have a hunting elk instance live in the environment. We have Sysmon installed on all the hosts. All this data was fed in. We exported all that data, and guess what? It wound up here in Elasticsearch. So not only is the data from each scenario different, the attack, the TTPs, right? but also the methods by which they were obtained and thus the data you have available to you. And that's what we also teach you in the course. If you collect data one way, you will have certain, met, you know, certain things available to you versus if you collect it another way, you may or may not have those things, you'll have other things. How do the field mappings come into play? How do you find data in each of those cases? We go over all that. So there's a cute little graphic for Samaran Protect. Go ahead and check out their website, samaranpro.com. Shout out to Jason Azarella, Jazzy, for putting that together for me. It's, good. it's a great website. Check it out. High tech. All right. So we went through this stuff. Let's get into the meat of the course, ransomware overview and history. In this section, we go over, we start with where did ransomware come from? What was the first known attack? How does it evolve? How has it evolved into this ecosystem that we deal with today? And this is an example of the slide we have. Well, this is the slide we have for ransomware as a service. Shout out to Northwave Security. This graphic came from them. I do not claim to have created this. It's awesome. And I love them to, for letting me use it. So now that ransomware as a service and human operated ransomware, meaning humans on a keyboard, not an automated deployment type of thing, right? Now that they've come together, there's an entire ecosystem. You have your initial access brokers, these are the folks who break into the environments and then either provide that to a ransomware operation crew directly or affiliates, or they sell it on the dark web. In fact, I think that's the next slide. There it is. I give you examples of darknet offerings, how companies are basically bought and sold, to be honest, right? You're buying access into a company, which means you're basically buying that company. And that's what the ransomware actors do. We also have our ransomware affiliates. We talk about the affiliate programs that these folks have. A popular example is the Babook ransomware crew. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. That's just the way I pronounce it. They had a fellow who goes by the name Wazawaka, and he put together the affiliate program and ran it for them. He eventually then opened the Ramp Forum when the other bigger forums decided to ban ransomware. We talk about all this stuff in the course. So the affiliate programs, they are actively recruiting. And I mean actively recruiting. They go out there and say, we're the best. Here's why. Come be our buddy. 
You have your data managers who deal with the data exfiltration, your operators who go in and, and actually provide the infrastructure and for that matter, the encrypting payloads and things of that nature. There's negotiators that we have to deal with. Oh, that's cute. There's money chasers. Oh, that's precious. Different types of extortion. And then you've got the accountants who deal with the money, you know, muling slash, uh, I should say washing, washing money, laundering the money. So here's some example screenshots from the course. I show, we show exactly how these things are bought and sold. Here's a threat actor selling network access, right? And then here's one who says, I'd like to buy network access. And this is a, this is straight from the, the quote unquote dark net, which is just, by the way, opening a Tor browser and just going to forums. That, that's all the dark web is, whatever with all that. But we give a bunch of screenshots. Here's another example. When you have a data leak site from a ransomware crew, we give you a breakdown of what they typically consist of. Aside from including actual screenshots with real data, we also have things like, what do they usually include? Images, example files, a list of the machines, blah, blah, blah. We also have a bunch of other screenshots showing like what these leak sites look like, and what some of the client portals like Black Matters, that's precious, right? Everyone that they attack, is they're not a victim, they're a client or a partner, whatever. We have a section where we talk about the psychological pressures that are enacted by these ransomware operators, some example chat dialogue, there's a bunch of that in the course also. And then we have our first lab. So I'm gonna be showing some of the information in our labs. We've got around, what, 15, 17 minutes remaining. So I wanna make sure you see some of this hands-on stuff. Here's an example, let's try to do it live. I'm sure Steven and the Sands folks are like, live? We didn't talk about live, Ryan. <laughs> what are you doing, man? So we're gonna go right here. We're gonna go to that guy. We're gonna type in that guy. We're gonna do it with that guy and that guy. Oh, of course. Well, I gotta spell it correctly, I guess. That would help. Hey, come on. There you go. So we have an example, uh, lab 1.1, where you log into a ransomware analysis, or excuse me, a uh, ransomware generator, and you actually build some ransomware. We're going to show you how to build out the ransomware, how to manipulate the ransomware, so on and so forth. Give me one moment. Luckily, that was empty when it opened. <laughs> that could have been funny. Oh, goodness. I prepped. I'm kidding. All right. Give me one second. I'm going to go over here. We're just going to live log into the sucker. Give me that guy. I want that guy. I talk to myself a lot. I know. That's okay. I want that guy. We're going to log in live. Do, 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 do. There's the username. And here's one of the passwords for the students. And log in. Survey says. I think it's going to log in. It's going to do it. Here we go. Check it out. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, baby. All right. So we talk about ransomware builders and how this facilitates a turnkey solution for the ransomware operators to then hire affiliates and provide custom payloads for them. So here's an example. We talk about how to build out payloads. Hey, look at that. And let me zoom in. Let's see if this works. There we go. Uh, look at the top right-hand side here. I can't draw while I zoom. I almost pointed at my screen. See right there? I stuck it out. The top right-hand side, encryption method, override and rename versus copy and remove. That is specifically how the ransomware or I should say how the encrypted files are written to disk. And that will affect your forensic analysis. How? How is the MFT going to be different? How's the log file and the US and journal going to be different? We talk about that in class. We can set a custom, excuse me, a custom encryption message, which we do in the course, a custom image, choose which targeted directories we go after, choose which file extensions we want to encrypt. We add a couple custom ones in the class. We generate the payload. That's just an example of one of the course labs. All right, understanding ransomware attacks on day one takes us into what is the flow of a ransomware attack? Like what happens? This is CertNZ's fantastic graphic. They have another one that does show mitigations. This one's cleaner for now, so I include it. And there's an overview of here are the various stages of ransomware attacks, right? You may have phishing or vulnerability exploitations or, well, that's also phishing, um, or RDP, extremely common methodologies of getting in, which is the password guessing to valid credentials. But then we get into Mr. Alan Liska's, thank you again, sir, for this graphic here that shows you basically the breakdown, initial access, let's highlight this guy, initial access through recon and lateral movement, data exfiltration, deployment of the ransomware, payload, by the way, 
And then overall extortion methodologies. There's a great number of tools. I'll just highlight this section right here. Look at that. Whoop, right there. These are phenomenal examples of things we see over and over and over and over. It's not these special tools that are crafted for every little attack. No, it's the same thing over and over and over. Like you said that already. I know. I'm trying to do it for a reason. Okay. So we talk about all the different phases, the tooling that we commonly see there. And then we start getting into how do you analyze all this? If you have not yet ripped apart the Windows Forensic Analysis poster or the Hunt Evil poster, commonly associated with Forensics 508, make sure to become familiar with those bad boys because we pull a lot of artifacts and review them that are defined and, and discussed and detailed quite a bit in those two posters. So here's an example of where if you come into the course and don't have a forensic background, if you will, right, or incident response background, some of this stuff may be a bit new to you. Windows event logs, sure. NTFS metadata, okay, registry high files. The registry, right, is a logical formation in memory that comes from a bunch of files on disk, which by the way, when people say fileless malware, I always start to get all like hot in the ears, like, ouch, there's nothing to say as fileless. If it's persistent, it has to live somewhere on disk. Get out of here. Anyway, evidence of ex execution, like user assist and shim cache and am cache. If you're familiar with these basic types of things, great. Here's an example of the tools we cover for collecting artifacts. So we primarily use CAPE. Shout out to Eric Zimmerman. Everyone's probably familiar with CAPE. And if you're not, cool. I'm glad to introduce more people to it. Siler, which is a tool that we use at day job where I work right now, we've actually provided, I'm saying we, but uh, Chapin, Bryce, because he's awesome, provided the most recent update to that bad boy. And then the cons of PowerShell response framework. We talk about tools and how to collect, not at scale yet. We start per host. Here's an example of all the individual directories and files you may want to collect. These are the default files that Siler collects. So take a moment to take a look at what you see on the screen here. while I buy myself a time for a sip of water. These are the types of things that you want to obtain for analysis. Once you've obtained those things, well, how do you parse them? That's where lab 1.2 comes in. And then, okay, you can collect data from a host. That's cute, right? But how's that, how's that gonna help you when you have a much larger environment? Well, now we need to scale things out. We talk about Velociraptor. This course is not infrastructure based. Okay, so we're not going to be like, here's how you install the Velociraptor and here's how you use it and configure it. However, a lot of that is covered in Forensic 608. Shout out to that crew. We then talk about, hey, if you want to collect at scale and use a tool like this, you can actually choose targets, CAPE target files, and collect them at scale. We also talk about you want to have tools like this installed before it hits the fan because when you install these types of things, you start stomping on forensic data. Right? If you have them pre-installed, the threat actor then comes in and you know farts around in your environment, then you're okay. So all these little things, nuances are covered. We also talk about if you're going to collect a bunch of logs, wouldn't it be cool if you're logging the correct things in the first place? So shout out to Hacker Hurricane and his malware archaeology site with LogMD. I freaking love this tool. We cover an example tool that shows you, you run it and you look in your environment and it goes, hey, you're not logging these things. Like, go go log these things. This is basically what it tells you. It's like, hey, hey, silly, go go do that. It gives you, look, look at the examples here. Uh, log files, way too small. Make it bigger, right? You don't want your data to roll over on you. So we cover all the fun stuff. And then we get into, after you've augmented your logs and such, and you've collected it, right, how do you analyze it? We use time sketch, and then we also, in an associated lab, and then we also show you a method with Kibana. Our scenario one data is collected via time sketch, excuse me, uh, collected via CAPE and ingested into time sketch after parsing it with Plazo. So here is an example. We're going to pop over to our course VM. We're going to go into time sketch. Here is our scenario one data. Not only have we ingested the data in time sketch and show you how to do it and provide the scripts that were used. Thanks again, Mark Holman. But you can see here that we go over. I guess you can't see it here. You would see it over here better yet. Let's go to labs one. There you go. So let's say you've never used time sketch, right? This is our lab. Let me stop scrolling so much. Give me a minute. Here you go. Here's a full breakdown. It's like, hey, you never used time sketch. Here's how to use it, right? One, two, three, four, pop, pop, pop. Here's what these things do. A breakdown of why they're important, how they relate to other labs, yada, yada, yada. 
the data we have has also been augmented. So if I go into Explore and I click on this guy, we have all the fields, we have our data types, and from the awesome blue team tools, we've got tags that are already, well, they're already tagged, <laughs> tags that are already tagged. And we have a bunch of saved searches. Like check this out, RDP started or ended. Oh, that could be handy. Scheduled task. Oh, that could be handy. These are all MITRE mappings, by the way. So these, how did we get these? How did this augment our data? How do we already have Windows logout events? Like how, how did you add that to our data? We show you, it's, that part's not difficult, right? It's not an infrastructure course, but it's just in a series of scripts. You clicky clicky and magic happens, right? We also talk about the analyzers and time sketch, how they can be useful. We show you how to create graphs, which are very, very useful in your labs. And of course, your full day capture the flag. Here's our Windows services, for example. I pop into this guy and I say, oh, I want to see Windows services that are named PS exec. I said, oh, hold on, two over. PS exe service, but right? And we've got this little guy right there. How many hosts was it on? Why is that important? If I click on that guy and I scroll down, oh, look, narrowing in on data. We show you how to tag items, which is that guy, label. We show you how to star them. We show you how to run contextual searches. We cover all of that. All right, and then that takes us into day two. And day two is all about the attack life cycle, right? We talk about infection vectors. It is almost always one of these three, RDP, phishing, or software vulnerabilities. And most of the time it's not a zero day, by the way. And most of the time it's not. It's something that's well known. It's been out for months or years or something silly. So an example of some of the, the lower level technical data we go over, if we were talking about tracking RDP activity, here are a bunch of event logs. And by the way, there are more. I know, I know. For those of you who are like, wait a minute, you forgot. I know, we've got a, a bunch of them, a whole bunches of them. Eventually, I'm going to create a course cheat sheet also and include a bunch of this stuff and just make it free for everyone to grab. But it's just an example of what we talk about. It's uh, not just, hey, this is bad. It's almost everything we cover is, hey, this is bad. Here's how it's leveraged to be bad, you know, doing bad stuff. And then here's how you find it. Here's how you go detect it or alert on it or hunt it or whatever you want to call it. We then go into a lab with where we find the infection vector. I'll pull the labs up uh, after we go through day two. Execution and persistence is next. We talk about, for example, the paradigm shift. Threat actors no longer have to build their own tools for the most part. They just go download stuff from GitHub is pretty much how it works. Or they leverage something like Cobalt Strike or Posh Sequence. Well, that's all GitHub stuff. So I talk about all the different ways that the uh, threat actors execute code, right? One thing, example, native execution methods. Exactly how they're leveraged what it looks like when they are leveraged, like the command line parameters and all that. And then of course, how to detect these things. Scripting engine abuse. We talk about PowerShell scripts and batch scripts and a little bit of JavaScript, some visual basic scripting. PowerShell and batch scripts are like bread and butter when it comes to freaking ransomware. There's, it's so common. So we give a bunch of examples. And we even talk about remote monitoring and management frameworks and how often they're leveraged for remote access. Here's some example names. No, no diss, if you will, to these organizations. These are, many of these are fantastic tools. It's just that ransomware actors are, are using them quite a bit. We then deobfuscate PowerShell code. So obfuscated code, we take a look into that, a little bit of malware analysis. Privilege escalation example, LSAS. LSAS is often dumped. Here are some tools and methodologies that we see. There's a bunch of stuff in the, you know, the slide notes and such and how to identify these things, what the commands will look like. Here's an example right here at the bottom of the screen. You can use Task Manager to dump it out if you're an admin. That's cute. We get into stuff like how do you identify lateral movement for RDP? And this is an example right here of RDP caching. So the RDP protocol has a feature that's usually enabled by default, by the way, that will cache in little bitmap um, tiles, which you can kind of see here. If you're thinking, well, it doesn't make a cohesive picture. No, it doesn't, but you can still see a bunch of really cool information. And we talk about why that's important. You can actually see an example of me collecting data with Siler. If you look dead smack in the middle of the screen there, you might see just to the right of the Internet Explorer icon, actually, you see CYLR. And that is because, and you can also see some remnants of PS exec and a bunch of other fun stuff. So in this case, this was me connected in, but for a threat actor, you can maybe see what they were doing. We have another lab on lateral movement. We have an entire section on Active Directory. A huge shout out to Cody Starks, a coworker of mine at Day Job, for putting this together.
we talk about all the different ways ransomware actors attack Active Directory. And many times these are using the same tools we see over and over and over. Um, this is a native method of using PowerShell to simply see if accounts are vulnerable to as rep roasting, for example. And then we get into data access and exfiltration. And in data access and exfiltration, we have a lab that goes over all, all the different forensic artifacts that you can use and how to identify you know, data access occurring using those artifacts, which takes us to day three. But first, let's take a look at some of these day two labs and go away. Day two. Hello. We're finding the infection vector. We go over stuff like office applications as parent processes. Why is Word a parent to a file called servicehost.exe or scvhost.exe? Like, what, what's that all about? We talk about Outlook content and downloads, the trust center, which is something where Microsoft has a built-in feature where when you click enable editing or enable macros or whatever, it actually adds the document to what is known as the trust center. So we talk about trust center analysis. I show you event IDs and information that's important for tracking registry data, such as using Sysmon event ID 13 for looking at these trust records to get filled out. Here's someone selecting to trust a document. How do you review that in your environment? All these kinds of fun things. We also get into PowerShell deobfuscation. So we start with an ugly looking PowerShell script. Let me show you an example, hold on. There you go. Uh, this is just standard encoded, but it looks ugly at first, right? Eh, the base 64 stuff. We break down all the parameters, like what? Are, why are these used? What do they commonly do? Why are those important? Things like that. Identifying data access and exfiltration. We use US and journal and MFT parsing. We make some educated guesses to find some really cool stuff. Just a, a kind of overview of some of your labs. Um, we look at some, we use Timeline Explorer a little bit for our CSV files. And then of course, when we scale out to Kibana and Time Sketch, we jump into those guys for at scale. On day three, it's payload deployment and encryption. So we talk about before they deploy the ransomware, well, they wanna, they wanna finagle some things, right? Disable recovery mechanisms. So I have some examples here of Windows mechanisms that are often disabled. This is, you know, other things we cover are volume shadow service and, and disabling EDRs and things like that. I show you an example script that the Maze ransomware team used to use where it has like 1200 lines that just tries to disable everything under the sun, just kind of hoping something fits, you know? We then get into Cobalt Strike. I show examples of how payloads are generated. We go into malware analysis of the beacon files. And that takes us into what if you are about to be ransomed, you are being ransomed right now, or you were just ransomed, right? What it, how does that all play out? What do you do? Who do you contact? What steps do you take? What teams do you have assist you? All these types of fun things. And if you look here, like if you don't have a plan ahead of time for your security tools, if you have to go dark and cut all internet connectivity, what if you have an EDR and now that EDR agent can't beacon out to the cloud? You should already have your pinhole rules all set up. Right? So if you don't have these things ready, ready to go and you do cut internet access, you may cut yourself off. So how does that work? So we talk about a lot of these considerations. We then get into a case study of the Conti ransomware group and then talk about hunting ransomware operators. As far as Conti is concerned, I chose Conti because they've had a number of data leaks. In fact, if you go to our course share here, I'll just pull it up here. 4528.com slash, nope, yep, share. If you go to our course share, there is a folder called, it's leaks or data leaks, leaks. And under leaks, we have Conti. And then in here, we've got all kinds of fun stuff. So we've got a bunch of their file postings. We've got their translated manual. We've got a ton of their parsed chats. So for example, here's this little guy right here. I think this, I think I clicked the right guy. Yeah. Here's their manual for attacking Active Directory that one of their uh, aggravated affiliates released. So we show exactly how all of this and then how all of their different chats and communications really highlight exactly how they operated. So even though that they, their access has, their activity has curtailed fairly recently, I want to use them because they're one of the best known groups because of how many data leaks they've essentially had. And we talk about hunting, for example, antivirus logs are so, so helpful because many times threat actors will try to execute something bad and your antivirus or your EDR or whatever will catch it. And they'll say, no, typically they then just disable it. However, 
if you're offloading those logs or if they don't delete those logs, it's so helpful to be like, wait, what, what's that right there? And why is it there? Another example is uh, a tool like Mimikatz, right? So common to see Mimikatz underscore trunk dot zip in your environment. It is a password slash credential dumper. Does all kinds of other amazing things like we talk about in the Active Directory section. If you see that tool in your environment, that is not an auto-propagating tool. Mimikatz doesn't just show up for no reason, right? It is either a threat actor or it's someone, hopefully at least IT, and your organization who decides, I'm going to put this on the host right there, right? So when your AV says, hey, there's Mimikatz over there, most folks don't hunt through that. They never even see it. When you see things like hack tool or hack or tool or PS tools or pup or even PUA sometimes, to be honest, many organizations, they never even look at those. Those can be critical to identifying ransomware. And we end the course with a, well, we end the third day with a hunting exercise where we pull apart, um, or technically where we show you some really cool things. Like here's identifying a renamed portable executable. Mimi Cats underscore trunk. I have it right there in the lab, right? Oftentimes it's not even renamed. However, if it is renamed, how would you detect that? How would you identify that? And we talk about the metadata information, especially the field called original file name. Zoom in a little bit there. There you go. And I give throughout the course, for example, if it's a tool like rclone to do data exfil, if it's been renamed, what's the original file name of the current versions? What's the process? Excuse me. What's the process name of the current versions? We try to provide a bunch of this information so that you can go and hunt these things down in your environment. Hopefully you don't have them, but you want to check, right? App data is commonly used. How do we, what's a Windows environment variable? How do you hunt for those? Why are those important? We give a bunch of regular expression-based queries on, hey, let's go look for stuff executing out of there. Let's look for these EXEs running in app data roaming or certain directors nested beneath and, and things of that nature. So. I know I just ran my mouth for a while and we talked about a whole lot of stuff. I'm going to go over to doop, the PD, uh, the PowerPoint better yet. Oh, we're done. That's the end of the PowerPoint. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen for right now. And I think we're going to move over to a Q&A. I hope that folks find the course interesting. Again, it is, it's been a, a year plus of hard work to put this together. And what we really want to show you are all the things that you need to keep in mind. And if ransomware hits, what are you going to do, right? That I might as well make that the tagline. If ransomware hits, what are you going to do? That's what this course is all about. All right, we're going to move over to some questions. I've got comments over here, starred questions. Here's one from, I guess I won't mention names in case folks want to be anonymous, but is this course suited for beginners or any prerequisites? So the prerequisites that I highly recommend, the number one is Forensics 500 or the knowledge you would obtain there. And to be more specific, if you simply just go, and by the way, they're in the VMs, right? So on the desktop of our VM, we've got, here you go, Windows Forensics Poster. I'm just going to click it. And I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Let me fix that. Share. And share screen. And I want to share the correct screen. Don't choose the wrong one. All right. Here, you should see the screen. There you go. This poster gives you a great example of what we're talking about. If you're not familiar with things like, you don't want a mouse wheel, huh? Okay, we'll do it like this. There you go. If you're not familiar with user assist or shim cache or things of that nature, you'll want to familiarize yourself with these things, right? Honestly, if you read this, just do some Googling around, Googling, then you may be suited you may be that may be enough but we cover everything in the course it's just that if you've not ever been introduced to them it will be pretty darn new for you and there will be a learning curve for darn sure so that's one example and then another idea is to look at the hunt evil poster and if you look at these processes and you're like you know what i, I don't know what services is so how does that apply to ransomware it's going to be far more work for you to, to get up to speed in the course. Services will typically run SVC host instances, which are then the handlers for actual services. When services are installed, there's a 7045 event ID that triggers. If you're familiar with those types of things already, awesome. If you're not, I highly recommend you check out these two posters, like top to bottom, and then again, and again, and again. So this is not a beginner course. It is, it's currently a 500 level course. We'll see after our alpha, which is, uh, holy goodness, it's tomorrow. I, I trained the first one. Ooh, I'm so excited. 
So uh, we'll know what folks uh, can expect going forward from the perspective of I don't have a ton of experience in the field, you know, thus far after our course alpha. Another question, how extensively do we cover cloud response? Not very extensive at all, actually. I, I spoke to that earlier in the day. And now that I think about it, I'm going to pull back a bit. Um, we don't really go into, you know, for example, in, in Azure, uh, how might ransomware hit you and things like that. We do talk about if you have, uh, you know, backups, if you're using like Azure, what was it, Azure files, Azure backup files, you know, using uh, write once read many like worm uh, so that you don't have the ability for a ransomware actor to go in and destroy your backups. We talk about if you're using Microsoft's backup and Azure also setting a pin so that if the ransomware tries to, uh, the ransomware, the threat actor tries to run a command to delete a backup or whatnot, especially via PowerShell commandlets that are native to the system, it pops up and says, oh, what's the pin? And they go, I don't know, I don't know the pin. So then they can't delete it. But it does, yeah, the course does not go uh, at all actually deep into specifically cloud-based intrusions. It What I meant to say was earlier, I should have said, that there's just so many servers that are run in the cloud that first, you know, will be impacted in terms of, you know, like Azure AD attacks against Azure AD, it's Active Directory, right? So things of that nature. And another question here, does ransomware have a strong neutral game? More seriously, with training being on a lot of teams' minds, what's a good elevator pitch for an analyst to make to leadership for this course? Is that someone from SANS? <laughs> that sounds like a great question. Like, how do we get people to take the course? I would say that uh, I'm I'm not where I'm not super sure about the strong neutral game part. But uh, here's the thing: the elevator pitch is this: is that ransomware is portrayed as this crazy advanced attack, but in reality, it's not. But there are so few people who are truly familiar with what it actually looks like to be hit with one of these campaigns. And we all need to train ourselves up. We all need to become far more familiar with what truly happens because it's a new ballgame, right? I was in an organization for many years. I see some familiar names in the chat, by the way. Hi, all of you. Um, with the organization for seven years prior to where I've been now for three years. And it was a very large organization, extremely well-tooled team. And I mean, like extremely well tooled. We had all kinds of developers just for security and all kinds of fun stuff. But we never got hit with a massive ransomware campaign, which, by the way, that's a good thing. Duh. Right. Even that group, if you get hit with ransomware, all of a sudden you realize, oh, this is very specific type of attack. You do realize oh, it's really easy. It's not that difficult to deal with. I, I should say, in terms of what you collect and how you analyze it, it is a major disaster, no matter what, if you get hit with ransomware. So the elevator pitch is really that so few people understand what ransomware really looks like, what an attack truly looks like. And we provide step by step, this is exactly the types of things you'll see. Here are the process names. Here's what they're doing. Here's why they're using this. So the goal is just you need to be prepared because when ransomware does hit, if you're not prepared, the magnitude of that attack is just whew, through the roof. The more prepared you are, the less downtime you're going to have. You're going to have downtime no matter what. But the more attuned you are, the better you're going to be equipped to deal with it all. Uh, question, how organizations should prepare for something like dark side? Um, wondering specific to dark side in terms of their TTPs or anything more specific you want to add there to that question. Uh, the reason I bring that up is that dark side is at its heart. Um, I'm just going to Google dark side ransomware, right? The colonial pipeline attack is, I assume why this question came up. So when dark side hit the colonial pipeline, you know, many people ask the question, how do we avoid such, here, U.S. Department of State, right, website. Let's go full screen on that guy, zoom in a little bit. They ask, how do you prepare for stuff like this? How do you prevent it? Well, let's talk about DarkSide. What was the infection vector of DarkSide? The infection vector was a remote access account for an old employee that was never disabled. That's what it was, right? 99% of the time, and I made that number up. I just pulled it out of the, out of the thin air. Don't, don't quote me on that number. Most cases, I think everyone I've ever had of ransomware that I've worked and that buddies and coworkers and friends have worked, 
it comes down to a failure of security 101 practices almost every darn time. That, sure, there's zero day cases like Kaseya and things like that. How did Darkseid happen? Because of a failure of security 101. When an employee leaves, what do you do? There's an offboarding process. I should say there should be an offboarding process. What does that process entail? It entails things from an HR perspective. It should also very specifically entail things from IT, including asset management or digital asset management, account disablements, deletions, th- maybe not deletions, things of these nature. They're all critical. How do you prepare for dark side or a crew just like them? You follow security 101 best practices. You enable MFA. You ensure RDP is not enabled on this, let alone your DCs or something critical like that, you know, to the internet. But there's all, the, and we cover a lot of these in the course, but a lot of it is just following security best practices. And from my old day job, Sean, if you're out there, you taught me that security 101 failures thing. I don't know how many times you said it, man. And uh, it's, it's just the same thing over and over and over and over. So while the attack may have looked as though it was extremely sophisticated, when it really breaks down, it was just another ransomware attack. In my mind, it's just another ransomware attack. There was nothing super special about the dark side ransomware attack. And I debate that all you want with anyone. Whoa, they did this. Whatever. No. Um, yeah. All right. I'll digress on that and go all day talking about that. So let's see what else we got here. Ba, ba, ba. I don't think I see any additional questions that were coming up on time. Ba, 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 ba. I think that that looks like mostly about it. Yeah, I'll call it unless I get a random uh, question that pops up. But I think we're just the top of our hour. So, hey, I want to thank everyone for hanging out and um, really, really appreciate anyone and everyone showing interest. Uh, A lot of love out to the Sands family for supporting me personally throughout this development process and my family for putting up with me. And I just I wish we can get this into the hands of as many people as possible to truly understand What's, what's it going to look like you know, when it does happen? What's it going to look like? And how do you prevent it by understanding the general failures? You know, uh, password dumping and credential access. Like, do you have Credential Guard enabled? It's free. Microsoft provides it, right? What's your domain forest level? Oh, it's 2008 because of you know, some excuse. Like, oh, that's cool. Like, that's awesome, right? <laughs> that's, that's a huge failure of what? Security 101 best practices. So if you're interested... I'd love to see you. We have a number of instructors already lined up. They're going to be sitting in my class starting tomorrow, right, for our alpha and beta runs. We're going to try to ramp this sucker up, get an on-demand course out there as soon as possible. Once again, my name is Ryan Chapman, author of Forensics for silly guy, 528 Ransomware for Incident Responders, and I'd love to have you come take the course.